have instigated it all. So I will take blame for that. Would you please join me in a pledge of allegiance? I pledge allegiance, allegiance to, to the, the flag of the United, United States, States of America, America and, and to, to the republic, republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Beautiful thing that is sitting there. Well, good afternoon, everyone. It is January 27th at 2 p.m. March. I'm sorry, January. Listen to me a little bit behind. Uh, March 27th. We referenced January about four times. <laughs> earlier meeting. <laughs> uh, call the meeting to order. Um, this is a workshop. And may I get a motion? Or do we have any amendments to the agenda? I would just question um, with the amount of people here for the presentation if maybe we want to take the department report after or move forward with the department reports. Oh, we can do the department reports after, absolutely. I would agree with that. Okay. All right. So we're going to move the department reports down to 4C. Any other amendments? Can I get a motion, please? I move that we approve the agenda as amended. Second. Second, Mr. Chair. I'll take roll. Commissioner Boyce, or Commissioner, or Commissioner Gold? Aye. Vice Chair Boyce? Yes. Aye. All right, so we're going to move down to 4A, which is Mike Robinson, Director of Coos Forest Protective Association, in their presentation. Okay, I'm going to kind of jump in here, unless Mike wants to, and then we'll have you kind of jump in a little. Uh, let me just tell everybody that this came about because Cape Varello had a huge fire November 11th, which happened after fire season uh, closed. And so anyway, what we were talking about as a fire department, and I'm kind of wearing two ha hats here. I'm the president of the board of the Cape Varello Fire Department. And what they were interested in is being able to, as a fire district, put an, a ban on fires after the original ban is set up. And the reason for that is, at least in our fire district, is because we have kind of different conditions there. We have more wind at the Cape Varello area. We also have a big infestation of sudden oak death, a lot of dead trees there. So there's a lot of fuel in that area. And this fire kind of just woke us up big time. And I also called South Coast Lumber. Is anybody here representing them? OK. Because that's where the fire started. And part of the problem was that our firefighters couldn't get on their property to fight that fire. I believe somebody was supposed to have been there to monitor the fire, and there was no one there when our firefighters got there. <coughs> and so what happened is we had to hire someone in to cut some of the brush and stuff so that we could get up the roads. And if I'm making mistakes here, Cape Ferrello fire people, let me know. And um, so it got to be a big mess. And it was rather scary. I got all kinds of calls that morning um, wondering what was going on. I called Jeremy Dumeyer, and he was gracious enough to tell me that, hey, we've got it under control and that sort of thing. So. Anyway, let me just give, I don't see Aaron, our fire chief yet, so let me just give you a quick, we did like a little presentation here and then we'll entertain uh, stuff from the audience. Okay, so here's what the county is, or what they, uh, the Cape Ferrello is asking the county for. We would like an ordinance that grants Cape Ferrello Rural Fire Protection District the ability to, to control its own fire season. And I would kind of like to extend that a little bit because I know that Harbor Fire District is able to ban fires in their area. I know that Brookings is able to do that. I don't know about Gold Beach or some of the others. Is Gold Beach here? Okay, no. they're not here. Okay, so anyway, this is what I would like to do as far as extend this. Uh, on October 26th, the fire ban was lifted by Coos Curry Forest. On November 11th at 6.12 a.m., the Cape Ferrello Fire Rural Protection District was dispatched. 
at 6.17 a.m., the chief arrived on the scene. As you can see, there's a pretty big fire there. The fire was on South Coast Lumber property up Logging Road, which was labeled Watering Hole. And this shows the three-day forecast. Um, we had the Checo winds, uh, 30 to 40 miles per hour, and it was 70 degrees and very dry. So that really wasn't a really optimal day to be burning slash. The fire was roughly four acres caused by slash fires that had been smoldering over the weekend. Wind was north, northwest at 29, 29 miles per hour with gusts up to 43 miles per hour. Let those numbers sink in and remember paradise and its wind-driven fire. And that was pretty bad down there. Okay, so Cape Ferrillo kind of has a special microclimate. We have steep, overgrown hillsides, unique wind patterns, and a sudden oak death problem. In fact, that's the worst sudden oak death problem in the county, there in the Cape Ferrillo area. To people and property, there were locked gates on the uh, roads there on South Coast Lumber. There were blocked roads. There were over, overgrown driveways. The county helped. The, here is Aaron. Come on in. I'll let you finish this. You just tell me when to flip the thing. Okay, where are we at right now? Oh, it's the last one. Okay. So maybe you want to add to this a little bit. I've gone through the slide presentation. Uh, the county helped the Cape Ferrello Fire District uh, control its own burn season in its own district. So, Aaron, maybe you want to just talk to... Yeah, I mean, I can give a brief uh, update of what we're going for. Our area is very unique, uh, very tight quarters, a lot of overgrown and dead material, uh, bad roadways, <coughs> and undermanaged uh, properties. We also have a hard time with keeping a constant volunteer staff department uh, getting the equipment to some of these locations are virtually impossible so in the sense of controlling our our own burn I, I do not think that Coos Forest has done a bad job in doing that I just think that our area should have more of a unique approach instead of a, a group approach it should have its own uh, opinion in whether the season can be carried on or locked down for a longer period of time during this last incident, it was still a bit dry. The winds were really heavy. Uh, the Paradise Fire was still going. So in my opinion, for my district, it should have been pushed back a little further, especially with as much commercial burning that happens up there and the large slash fires. You know, those can easily be blown out and be out of control in a harpy. So I think it's important for us to be able to have the ability to tell people no burning up there if it's not time to burn. That's basically it, in a nutshell. Okay. Okay, did anybody else from, say, Coos Curry Forest Protection Service or any of the other fire departments want to speak to this issue? And then I've got something from our code enforcement officer who was a previous fire, uh, he was involved in uh, firefighting. So I've got some of that also to bring to this meeting. So did anybody here have anything to say to this issue? Come on up. Come to the microphone, John Bischoff. He's on our fire board also. John Bischoff, 96333 Wildwood Road, Brookings, Oregon. What I want to say is that the entire burning season should be pushed back, maybe a month, because it's this is the second time in 1991 the city of Brookings was virtually surrounded by fire, ringed by fire, because of slash burns that got out of control. Remember that. And <clears throat> I think that the fact that Coos Lumber or uh, South Coast Lumber goes and starts to burn regardless of what the weather situation is, and regardless of what, how dry it is, I think that the fire season should be pushed back a, a month from where they do it and let the rains really get started before they start. Thank you. John. 
John, here's a question. Yes. Um, we had a, a sod workshop up there, June of 17, yeah, June of 2017. And we saw some of the, uh, you referenced, or maybe the, the Chief Aaron did there, um, some of the, uh, the understory of the neighbors and, you know, some doing a very good job on the firewise responsibilities and some of them, yeah, lock gates. And, and have you seen any improvement on that being on the board of the Cape Royal Fire District? Is it, are, the, are the citizens catching on a little bit, especially after the well, last couple of years? And, <laughs> The that might idea be a question of a defensive for... space is really kind of a uh, misnomer in that area because the brush grows back so fast. You cut the brush and you're looking behind you and it's already growing, especially in the summer. And I really think that the idea of trying to defend an area is, uh, I know that for a while the Coos Forest had a, a program where they would come in, they'd hire people to fire come well. in and, and firewise, as it was called. And that's fine. You could cut the brush, but it'd be back the next year and you'd have to do it all over again. It just grows so fast. And you, uh, when the uh, bar fire was going, I was working with search and rescue to notify people that they were in a evacuation area. And we stopped up on Carpenterville Road and I asked one of the firefighters up there if a uh, clear cut area provided any uh, fire break. And they said no, because the brush grows back so fast in it that even if it's clear cut and the overstory that shades the brush out is gone, the brush comes back so fast. So that's why I think that fire season should be moved back a month. Okay, thank you, sir. Mr. Robinson, do you have any expertise to add yeah, to this? I'm just gonna chime in and everybody else can I'd like to have every, uh, I mean, we've got some real good professional firefighters here, and I'd, I'd like to get some comments from, from you guys. So, uh, Mike Robinson, uh, District Manager for mm -hmm. Coos Forest Protective Association, and, and nice to meet you, Ms. Gold. So, nice to meet you. I haven't we've seen had you. quite a few. Yeah. So, I, I will talk, um, and thanks, John, for the, the, the fires that John spoke to uh, around Brookings in 91. Actually, it was 1993. I was down here as a unit forester at that time. And <laughs> so let, I'm just gonna set some frameworks here for how fire season comes and goes. In 1993, we'd had a couple inches of rain. Uh, I was not the district manager at that time. Like I said, I was here as a unit forester. We had two or three inches of rain down here. It was October 11th, I believe we went out of fire season. October 15th, it was pouring down rain. I remember this because I was in Huskanon Creek up where the slide is currently giving us a problem and we were, uh, South Coast was burning sli uh, landing piles in the pouring down rain, October 15th. October uh, 18th, uh, they, uh, the rain quit. Uh, by October 24th, all the slash burns that had been lit uh, were, uh, came to life and started threatening and burning. And we ended up burning, spending $1.4 million in Curry County that, that fall after fire season was off. It's not an uncommon thing. The thing we got to be careful of is, uh, uh, is the rain and, and understanding how, far, how long we do need to push fire season out before we put it off. It's not a, it's not a month period of time. It's not a week period of time. It's, it's about taking fire season off after you've had the seasonal events you need and seeing that the, the storm tracks are lined up out in front of you over the ocean. I like to see two or three storms lined up before we take fire season off and some rainfall that we've seen. And we follow the trends of rain and uh, summer conditions all through fire season. We, we have a, a scientific modeling system that we use that is called NFDRS, National Fire Danger Rating System. And it has indice, what we call indices that indicate to us fire severity, fire danger, how bad a fire will run, 
uh, and we really hang our hat on what's called ERC, which is energy release component. And when it gets to a certain point, when it through the summer it goes on a trend like this because of the dryness. And when it gets to certain thresholds, we put additional closures on for our logging communities to, to manage fire risk. So, and then when we see the rain come in the fall, that ERC number starts doing this. And when it gets to a certain point, and then when we see the conditions out over the ocean and the storms are lining up, and I think we're there, we take fire season off. Our normal fire season over the last 10 years is about 110 days. Uh, we were in fire season for 141 days last summer. Uh, we, we saw the, the fall weather being stubborn. Uh, the first part of October, we, we had some rain. We kind of left the Agnes community a little bit. On October 14th, we were back because of an east wind event. Blow up, yeah. We were still in fire season at that time because the ERC had not done this enough and we had not had enough storms. We had some rain, but we were not out of fire season. So through our experience, and it's not an exact science, we do use modeling and anybody that uses models knows the saying that uh, all models are wrong, some are useful. And so we, even if it's, we've always used that as a useful tool for us to determine the fire danger levels. So I don't think we took fire season off too soon. Uh, I, I think that we have east wind events, it's not uncommon. The, the event that we had when we had the Cape Ferrello fire was was a normal two to three day event. Uh, so, um, and the fires that were on the landscape uh, were there for, for a period of a week or so prior to that morning. Uh, was it a Sunday morning, I believe? Yeah, it was Sunday. And, uh, and then Derwin was, was up the commander there so he can speak more to this and I won't speak to the fire activity, uh, the, the operations. But uh, I know South Coast in the days leading up to this had efforts out there all the time and, uh, and they were there daily and, uh, and sometimes overnight uh, taking care of their, the fires that was on the landscape there. Doing what the law, our law requires, makes them do when they put fire to the ground. And I guess in the ask of, of keeping fire season on longer, that would be my responsibility. Um, I, I, I shared an email with Sue not long after this event. She was requesting that I put fire season back on. And I said, no, I'm not gonna do that because I think the conditions are fine. We just had an event that we just have to live through and I don't wanna overregulate people. And then, but the other question here is, is can the fire departments put their own fire season restrictions on? And that's not my, in my wheelhouse. That's a different authority and Jeff Henderson and Jim Watson can speak better to that because they, they understand and live in the fire district world, I don't. So even if Cape Ferrello, or even if at the county level, the, the fire di districts were able to do that, it still does not regulate the burning that goes on for slash disposal. That stays with me and that would not take that away. Yes, sir. Is that for all slash disposal it's, all over the county or it's, it's for disposal of industrial anything that falls under smoke what we would call smoke management where that they have to get like guidance South Coast or any other large business and the small backyard burns in the districts that would not apply to so that's something that if it was legal under the authority they they could they could impose that in, at the, even though my fire season was on on but that is under so that would be for the local fire districts they're able to do the the small fires but only goose and and it's my understanding that that would under the current breadth of the law and under chapter 476 and i'm getting into a chapter that is not my chapter uh that it's not allowed to do that and jeff and jim can explain that better than me okay Thank so you. i i just wanted to let you know that we have a, a pretty rigid system and an understanding of, of and, be, and, and we are very patient about taking fire season off. Because after you've been in fire season for 141 days, you want to take it off. You are tired and you want to do something else with your life. But I've been doing this long enough that I know what it, what it takes to, to be safe. And we know that people are going to burn after we take, take the regulations off because we've held them off all summer long. And, and at the workshop, the meeting we had a couple uh, last month with Merv George here, we talked about the importance of having fire in our communities. 
I agree with John Firewise is a is a baby step. The biggest thing we got to do is try to educate people that, yeah, if we come in and do Firewise or whatever, you need to maintain that because the Paradise Fires of the world, I can guarantee you, are a lot because of our responsibilities as private landowners of not taking care of our own properties. So to me, it's an education thing. I've, I've Julie reached out after our last meeting and we've talked about, how, well, what, how do we educate? How, what do we do? And workshops are where we need to get started here and working with the county to educate our communities. We sh we're gonna have fires behind us all the time. The Forest Service, that, that ground will burn again. And we need to put more fire to the ground, probably not more regulations. Commissioner Gold. Okay, I'm not here to, to criticize or anything, <coughs> but I'm just wondering if on these big burns, like yeah. South Coast burns, if yes. there could be some requirement they are there to monitor the thing 24-7. Yeah. yeah. And I think that was part of the problem. It wasn't being monitored 24-7, <coughs> yeah. according to the people that were yeah, that, there. That's, that slash burn was in the... The, the final stages and it was they had been there and put out an effort for a week and and yeah we can we could say that maybe they should have been there for 24 7 I think they I don't know the time frame Derwin would know better but there was effort being done there they didn't just light that and walk away they had been with that thing hanging on to it for a week and because of the weather and uh, making sure that they that, you know they don't want it to get off the ground either and the thing about that fire was is that once it got out of the slash and got into some managed stands that they had managed uh, the fire laid down and it was controlled so thank you sir yes Commissioner Boyce you know you're not going to get away without a question it's working out <laughs> you mentioned Jeff Henderson State Fire Marshal and our county uh, fire chief uh, Jim Watson yes. um, in Derwin uh, manager here at Gold Beach uh, yes, when you were here a month ago, you mentioned, and you just mentioned it again a little bit on the industrial side of that, and you have a 141-day season. Yeah. That makes the uh, prescribed burns and the, and, that, and the importance of letting them get that fuel removed yep. in a shorter period of time. It's compressed. You compressed, and it, when it builds up, uh, it, uh, it puts that pressure on all of us, all of our local fire districts and uh, rural fire departments. and. Uh, in, Mr. Bischoff mentioned something very interesting there on the firewise. It grows back so fast, but that's part of living here. We have that responsibility. We have to do it. If it takes four times a year, whatever it takes, uh, it's for your long-term livability here. And so uh, I know that's easy for me to say. A lot of people don't have the access and the tools and yes. the, the help, but uh, back to you, you reference uh, Director Smelzer there. How do we let the public know? Boy, the two fire seasons we've had, right? Uh, way past that 110-day average. Yes, we we just need to keep respectfully, but uh, you know, beating that drum. So, and it, and I'm I'm sensitive to the fact that we don't want fire in our communities. And bad fires, like you know, and that and that's that's not not acceptable. And we don't want that. The problem with fire is it's not an exact science, and we're dealing with the weather. Oh, I totally understand yeah, so that. So we, 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 we're on the same page here. It's yeah, just, we just want to work with you so that we can get the best solution yeah, for, yeah. for our community. So. Yeah. I have a piece of property in Roseburg that's snow damaged so badly right now. And so my responsibility as a landowner, I've reached out to the county and some other places, and basically it's my responsibility to clean that up. So that's what I'm, I'm my back hurts right now, but <laughs> that's what we're working on, so. But we need to get that mentality in our public. Thank you. Thanks for coming. Appreciate okay. it. Mr. Boggs, do you have anything you'd like to add? Uh, yeah, a little bit. Um, <laughs> and no sarcasm. Um, I was, like Mike said, I was a commander that morning. Uh, my phone rang. I don't know what time it was. It's been too long ago. I can't remember what happened a week ago. But it was about 530 in the morning. And uh, so I, I knew that we were shorthanded. So I called the sheriff's office and asked him to page out the fire department for us. So when I got there, the gate was already open and people were there. So just to kind of understand the way this, this fire uh, took off was it in a, a unit about 80 some acres, I'm not quite sure specifically. Um, and they had been working on it for a little over a week. South Coast Lumber had been there working on it. 
and they burned the piles in the unit. So they had, they had, they're required to monitor those piles on a daily basis and make sure that they're not outside of the unit. When I say outside of the unit, I mean the piles that they burn, there's still some unburned material around that, around those piles. So when the weather changes and the wind event came in, it got into that unit outside of the piles, which is still on their property. It only actually burned uh, two acres on the private property. So everything was on their land. They had representatives there helping us and they put out a great effort to do that every time they have a fire. Um, one thing I wanted to point out, but this was not the only situation that happened that day. We had some stuff from sixes uh, on another company's land. We had some stuff up north in our district. So this wasn't the only um, isolated incident that happened in the district. So uh, we were there a little over a week. Uh, we had some stuff on Euchre Creek that we were working on over a week. And then it happened again in what, uh, I don't know, what was that language when we were oh, early yeah. in the morning, like 3 o'clock? <laughs> was that in December? Yeah, it was the wind event. In the wind event again in December. Uh, we had we had 70 to 80 mile an hour winds uh, on a fire in Langlois. And, um, you know, the fire department was there, the same situation. But it, the landowner was burning legally and, and doing what he was told to do. So uh, Mother Nature sometimes can't, you know, dictate what we do. And we don't, we can't can't guess what's going to happen next. Uh, I've been doing this for 28, 29 years, and we have slash burns that get away. Um, and it's not, most of the time, it's not because of the landowner, it's because of the, the weather. Uh, this particular thing, you know, it, we got we got a handle on it really quick. Um, thanks to the fire department, it was not really threatening anything other than uh, uh, some green grass in a swampy area, but it, it didn't get close to any residents. Uh, and we were able to get a cat trail around it by some local people that helped us out and we got a handle on it pretty quickly and uh, got things settled so um, to me it was not it's a normal everyday incident for me um, it didn't think anything out of the ordinary other than on the way down there it did look like the world was on fire and, but uh, and there is a there is a potential hazard there in the Cape Frilla area we've been up there several times we've been we have people that patrol that that neighborhood every year we have a forest officer in that area and and we know there's a problem there. Uh, but to fix that problem, it takes participation from the local landowners and it takes participation from, from us and, and education and, uh, and money, you know, to take care of some of the fire wise that program in that area, so. Thank you, sir. Yep. You like to say something, Mr. Watson? You guys good? <laughs> so anyways, uh, Jim Watson, uh, Brookings Fire Chief, uh, and uh, the fire defense board chief for Creek County. But um, I've had the privilege of working with Mr. Robinson since I came to work here and with the Forest Service back in 1991 and Mike was the unit forester. So I remember 1993 very well. And I've seen that since uh, Mike's gotten to be the, the head guy up there in Coos Bay that um, he's really, he remembers 1993. Um, so I, I think our fire seasons have been set by our wildland partners very well. Um, Forest Service are not here representing themselves, but um, you know, they, they're pretty, I think, um, spot on when they do it. And like we said, fire is not an exact science and it just does get away. Um, and in regards to what Chief Johnson said about um, us restricting the burning in Brookings that day, um, we have a, uh, in our municipal code as the fire chief, I can go out and suspend all burn permits, um, suspend. We usually allow backyard fires um, without permit in the city of Brookings, but we can also suspend all burning underneath, underneath our municipal code. And I think that um, the, if the county was to do that with residences, um, they would, they'd have to get the, uh, as the fire chief of also two um, rural boards, that I could go to them and if that's what they wanted us to do, then we could go to a permit system um, in their the districts, but I don't think that would cover the um, inside the, the, the industry, industry side of that. So, no, but we do, um, that day I did, um, I, was, I was on vacation, got a call from, from my captain that was on duty that day, said that uh, the fire was burning up Carpenterville. Um, then I, we have an active 911 app. So I was seeing that we were getting more fires around us. Um, so I just suspended our permits. Um, not so much for the fact that I thought we were gonna burn the town of Brookings down, but I know I didn't wanna burn out the volunteers. 
So I just told my dispatch, called Chief Larson of Harbor, <laughs> that they also have a permit system they run out of fire season also, that I was suspending permits and they'd had a few fires in their district that morning to go ahead and just suspend the, the permits just so it wasn't taxing our people. Cause we had people up at Carpenterville, we had people and Fort Dick was up, they ran a call up the north bank of the river. And then we had a couple of calls out in the Harbor Fire District that day that it was just running our volunteer, which we all know that's pretty much the, the muscle of our fire service in Curry County is volunteers. So uh, just to make sure we didn't get something going, um, but that's how we do it inside the city. We have the municipal code that I can that backs me up on that. Commissioner Gold. Can I ask you one question about permits? Because I, I have a proposal here from our code enforcement officer to make it easier for people to get permits. But anyway, do you have to issue a special permit for everybody who does these slash burns or yard well, fire? Basically, type it's thing? just we just we only do uh, small small pile burns, um, brush disposal permits right, right. Um, you know the city outlawed burn barrels I can't even remember Quite how long ago, ago that was yeah. about 20 years ago um, so we don't we don't do that well we do go out and make an inspection for each permit um, and we only let our permits run for uh, two days at a time right because uh, so what we found what well, we gave it. a seasonal permit is that you would have neighbors burning seven days a week all day long and then the neighbors that don't like burning would be complaining so we ended up right. with getting a lot of civil stuff so we we restricted our permits you can have a permit for two days and then you can apply for another one after four days so that you're not burning okay you may be interested i i will read this after from the code enforcement officer about having a possible way for people to get permits which would lift a a load off of you a bit anyway so i'll do that before the end of the the, uh, workshop and I don't today. do any permitting inside my, my rural districts. Um, we kind of go with the fire season thing and we never really had a problem with the Brookings Rural Fire District or the Upper Checo Fire District. Um, but as you said, there we in down that, that corner of the state and well, this whole county, um, we have different weather patterns when you go three miles up the road. So You're right. it's, uh, <laughs> it is it is a challenge here. And so each times. district is kind of unique and I think it should be up to the district to decide and you that know, may how be they the want best. to handle it and, yeah. if that's the, the way that the county was to want to go is probably put it in the hands of the the district boards mm -hmm. um, with their chiefs okay would we need an ordinance maybe i should ask county council would we need an ordinance to allow each district to be able to take care of those issues on their own i don't think so if, if i could just kind of ask a question or ask maybe the fire folks in the room to kind of help me out with this um, so here in our county, we've got the CFPA, and you guys are also in Coos County, and you guys handle mainly forest lands. And you guys are, you know, the, the forest protection district, as I understand it. And then there are fire districts, which are their own districts. They're a local government, and they're created by the people within the district, and they have their own staff and chiefs and things like that. And then there are cities with their own fire protection areas. My understanding is the county regulates burn permits or burning in any areas that aren't covered by any one of those three. And um, then there's these cla different classes. I just haven't found uh, any properties, it seems like, in our county that aren't either covered by the CFPA, a local fire protection district, or a municipal district either by the, so, so Commissioner Gold, I don't think our county, and, and the statutes allow the Board of Commissioners to grant these permits in areas that aren't covered by any one of the three groups that are represented here, but because most of our county, as far as I know, is protected by one of these groups, we don't, our commissioners don't play a role. And then when I look at the definition of fire season under Chapter 477 of the statutes, which is the, the CFPA group, um, they declare the fire season for themselves and then it says it's unlawful once they declare a fire season in their district, again, not the Cape Ferrello or another district, but once they declare a fire season in their district, it says it's unlawful within their district or within one eighth mile of their district to um, smoke or use, do, do some things. Um, so they have 
when they declare a fire season, it's it's all their district and anything within an eighth of a mile of their district it looks like from Chapter 477. That could have some overlap with with the local fire protection districts, but I think the local fire protection districts are allowed to self-govern. Um, I don't I don't know that. Do, are you do you think, uh, Mr. Robinson, that your um, declaration of fire season do your rules then apply outside of your um, forest protection district? So uh, the one eighth of a mile, well, yes. Okay. But, so we'll clarify. So yeah. you're you're exactly correct that you have the cities, you have the the rural fire districts, and you have us, and then of course the Forest Service back behind okay. us. Okay. And but our, if you look at the definition in four seven seven of our district boundary. Okay. So our boundary is all inclusive of the, so it's the cities even it within our boundary. Okay, that's good to know. And all, right. and all the rural fire districts are within our boundary. Okay, that's and, the part that didn't jump out at me from the yeah, right. And we, and we still have responsibility authority within the rural fire districts if it's forced land and that pays assessment to us. Okay. And that's, that's how that's determined. Very good. Yeah, so you're right on. There are three different entities here you're, deal you're talking about. Uh, the problem is, is our district encompasses all of it. So let's say, for instance, then, and, and again, I'm, I'm trying to, and I know maybe this is a question for the lawyers of the fire protection district and not so much the county, and maybe you're all, I guess you guys have the state lawyers, but let's say, for instance, you all did say, we're going to say fire season's over, yes. and you have this whole thing. Yes could within a smaller subset of a self-governed rural fire protection district, could they, it, I'm, I'm trying to figure out why they couldn't then make their own rule to, to establish their own fire season rules where yeah, they enforce their own stuff. And, and that's, that, their authority comes under 476, yep. uh, and I'm 477. So I'll, I'll speak just briefly to 477, and then Mr. Henderson, maybe he can help us, uh, okay. as the deputy fire marshal sure. can help us. Uh, All right. So. With, because we encompass everybody, yep. and then we put so, and we and we we have land that pays us within the fire districts. Now we don't have land. We in, down here, Brookings City doesn't pay us anything. So then his ordinances, uh, Chief Watson's ordinances, play into the city. Uh, Gold Beach, the city would be the same. But where we're out inside the rural fire districts, under their rules, they can have a fire prevention plan, which allows them to do burn permits. Okay. Uh, Harbor does that. Okay. Uh, so they have a fire prevention plan and they issue permits. The other districts in the county allow us to do that for them so they don't have these fire prevention plans. Okay. And if you have a fire prevention plan, and I'm going way deeper than I should be here. No, you're uh, good. The, the, uh, then, then you have to enforce and you have to uh, administer. Sure. And, and so when we do permits, and uh, uh, Commissioner Gold talked a little bit about, well, do you have to go to every, every person and do that? And sh there may be, you may not have to do that. You may be able to do it on the internet. You may be able to do some other things. But the, the crux of the thing is, is you gotta, you gotta administer it year round. You can't just do it when you want to. Yep. So you gotta have horsepower in the, at, the district, at the district levels, and then you gotta have a way of enforcing. Okay, but the county commissioners don't need ordinances on no, this. Yep. that is okay. correct. That's, that's kind of what I thought. I don't think an ordinance is the right thing yep. to do. Correct? Okay. Well, we're getting a lot of clarification today, and I really appreciate it. Yep, thank you. I wonder if, uh, yeah, I can say yeah, you, yeah get discuss, me out of the 476 world. <laughs> discuss the 476. Jeff Henderson, Deputy State Fire Marshal for Coos, Curry, and North Douglas counties. Um, there's some touchy subjects here, and some of the problem that I have is I'm just coming into this and not really aware of what the history is going on here. Um, I was asked to accompany you guys on this meeting today to kind of help guide you through it. A lot of what we're dealing with is already in statute. It's already in our ORSs. And the way that it works is every fire chief in the state of Oregon is underneath the umbrella, underneath that, their assistance to the state fire marshal. The state fire marshal has these rules in effect on how to manage these situations. So in reality, if we're gonna try to create something new, I don't foresee it being able to happen. If we want to be able to manage something that already exists, I believe that we're able to make it happen. So one of the things that I would recommend under the 476 is that you contact us as the state fire marshal to help walk you through and give you the right roadmap to success. Um, 
there's issues with unincorporated areas. You guys, um, I think some of Carpenterville Road may be unincorporated, you know, where there's no fire protection district up oh, there. There are some there. So in those wilderness, wilderness retreats, some are, other things in that but are, aspect. If I could, are they not then covered by CFPA though? The, the structures are not covered by CFPA. Okay. Okay, the property around the structure, correct me if I'm wrong, is, is CFPA protected. The structures themselves are not and is where that authority comes into effect is through the sheriff's department the sheriff has the authority being the constable of the county to oversee that fire area however he's under the state fire marshal at that point in time so chief jim walker state fire marshal's office is the the highest level that we can go next to getting to the governor so in in saying that you want to and i may be misunderstanding that this isn't a county-wide question. This is more based off of the Cape Ferrello Fire District. Is am I? But I would, you know, if this would apply, I would think to all fire districts to be able to do this. Okay. So. And it does, like mm -hmm. we say, um, they have the authority. Like uh, Chief Watson has one for his district where he oversees the permitting and things like that. We have this problem throughout many agencies, uh, Charleston Fire up in Coos County, they're in the process of trying to get a permit process. But then when they look at the overall cost and the headache of trying to maintain that process, it's, it's a whole lot more justified to follow Coos Forest guidance on when fire season is and when it's not. And the reason that they say that is, is because one, the cost of maintaining it, and two, they're the most knowledge resource in the area of when we should be able to burn and when we shouldn't be able to burn. So if the local jurisdiction that's overseeing the vast majority of the property is saying, you know what, we feel that it's okay with all of our stats and our analysis and everything else to take fire season off, that's generally the best guidance to go by is the companies, the, the programs that oversee that. And so as the state fire marshal's office, I'm willing to assist in helping you guys develop a permitting process so do you have a card? I do have a card with Okay, me. cool. Yep. And I'll get it later. Yeah, no problem. And uh, yep, that one for district by district. It's very hard and next to impossible to implement a county-wide one because the majority of the fire districts have no interest in doing this due to the manpower requirements and Absolutely. the labor requirements that come from it. So my recommendation would be follow what Coos Forest Protection Agency or U.S. Forest Service, because they're also looking at that big umbrella. They're looking at DEQ, e e the EPA, all the Air Quality Acts, everything else all falls into when you can burn and when you can't burn. And even us as the state, we can't sit there and say, you know what, we just don't want you to burn today. Why? Is what the answer, that's what people are going to question us. Why can't I burn today? Well, if we have our facts and we say, well, we looked at the air quality requirements for the day and it says that, you know, due to the air quality in Medford, Curry County can't burn today because of updraft situations or whatever is coming up, then that tells us, okay, you know, here's one of the requirements that says you and Curry County shouldn't be burning today. We just can't create our own comfort, you know, to do it for out of a comfort reason instead of out of a factual reason. So I have a question. Uh, as a board, fire board, we had discussed the problems of possible liability issues by issuing those permits and then something happens, are we going to be responsible? Are, are all these things that we need to think about? Most definitely. And I would highly recommend that every fire board speak with their legal counsel prior to trying to implement any kind of a permitting process. Uh, do simply to liability and you may be able to speak on that a little more than I can but um, you know it's just why recreate the wheel you know when we have the authorities there to be able to manage this stuff and the fire districts do have authority we just need to make sure that each district understands their authority understands how to implement their authority and know where their boundaries of authority are so that and that's why we're having this workshop, so everybody yeah, and, understands the ramifications. And that's of, what oh. me, being the Deputy State Fire Marshal for this region, right now I'm representing Chief Walker and willing to say, I'll go to any district that needs help and we'll work with you guys on figuring out how to, you know, fix the issues of the district to understand what the requirements are that 
you know, the state fire marshal, the governor have enacted on the state. Well, I, I got to say, I have no more, I could have no more confidence in the people that are in charge of those decisions in this county and the state right now. You guys do a tremendous job, and Merv George, what he's done coming, stepping into here as well, I just, uh, I sleep well at night knowing who's got their finger on the, on the decisions in this county. I think a lot of what we need to do, though, is educate the public more on what they can and can't do to help you to fight exactly. fires and stop fires. So mm -hmm. I and think it would behoove this board to somehow maybe get with some of you and, and come up with a strategy to educate our public on what they can and can't do and what they should and shouldn't do in this county to help. Most definitely. And that's where my point was kind of going towards in that direction is that we can have the fire up on Carpenter Hill or whatever, whatever area this was at, that can happen every year. But we can also have the same fire happen in the guy that doesn't maintain his property within your fire district that burns your fire district up. So in this particular case, we have resources that understand there's a fire burning there and they had been managing this fire until it got to that point where it wasn't necessarily considered a hazard weather conditions changed you know within a short amount of time cause that fire to spread things happen but when we educate our public the people within our jurisdiction on fire wise yes the brush does grow quick but that's our job as property owners to maintain our brush so if it grows back every year then every year we should try maintaining that brush to help prevent a major loss within our jurisdiction and so i think fire prevention and education is way higher on the need level than the going in and putting more rules and laws into effect for no necessary reason. I have a funny quick story. When I first moved here, I talked to a friend of mine and he said, I asked him what he was doing over the weekend. He said he was camping in the backyard was with his kids listening to the grass grow. That's how fast it grows here. And that's true. <laughs> that sounds like a cow story. <laughs> And, and just so you guys know, I'm based out of North Bend. Um, I'm not based out of the Salem office with all the concrete and everything else around. I'm a native to this region, and, and I have a lot of love and respect and pride for this region as well as all of the fire districts. And that's what makes me a, a, a good fit here is that I'm willing to get into the roots of this and help you guys learn and educate and push forward through the community and not just be like, hey, here's Salem's rules and step away from it. So if you need help, that's what I'm here for, is to help you guys get through this. Thank you, sir. And I appreciate if you leave, leave your information with yeah, us. Most definitely. Summer? I have a question. Are there practical alternatives to addressing the flash piles outside of burning? Uh-oh. That's I, When there is a lot of, uh, there's, 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 there's different degrees of burning. So if you have a large unit and it's, and it's got a lot of slash on the ground, and in this country down here, tan oak is a problem because tan oak is not always merchantable. And so you have to have a fairly strong chip market for that stuff to come off the ground. So if it's left on the ground, you have a, quite a load of, of hazardous fuel that needs, should be burned in, in, across the landscape. If they're able to pull it to the landings, which they do a lot of, and they spend extra money pulling it up to where they're working, where they load trucks, uh, then that just creates an area that has to be burned at, at that landing site. So that minimizes the risk of burning and, and, the, and the amount of time it takes for that to be, go from a slash pile down to nothing to where it's, where it's fairly safe. And we see a lot more of that. We see a lot of piles burning. We see very little landscape burning uh, that we used to see in this county back in 1993 when that was all going on. Uh, most of it's either piled burning or uh, landing burning. And that's an investment of the landowners working in a different way, spending more money to get the material to the landing so that they have less risk when they burn and less uh, effort to have to get the, the slash burned. Thank you, sir. Yep. Mr. Barnes. Um, what I'm gathering from all this is that the individual fire districts aren't allowed to set their own burn seasons, but 
being that the district is over 100 miles long or 150 miles long from up in Coos Bay down to the, to the county, would it be able for you to separate the district where, like, uh, Cape Ferrello is its own microclimate? Can you separate out to where it's, oh, are you able to say that it's okay to burn in Gold Beach but, and Brookings, but not in the Cape Ferrello area? Are you allowed to set individual burn seasons for the different microclimates of your whole district? Because, and let's face it, we are different as you come down the coast, so. Actually, it seems like more as you move just slightly inland. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah it's inland for us. So, yeah. so the answer to that is uh, yes, sort of. Uh, so we have uh, regulated zones, and it's not it doesn't it's not each individual fire district. It's weather zones. So, so it's more related to when you go from the from the beach inland, and as the weather gets drier. So we have lines. For example, the Cape Perello Road. Uh, Carpenterville Road, sorry, from uh, Pistol River uh, is the, a boundary. So anything on the west of that is called a zone called CS4. Anything to the east of that toward Bosley in that country and up toward Wilderness Retreat is called CS5. So, and then we have this same philosophy in our district as we march north uh, up toward the Lane County line. So we have five different managed zones where we have restrictions in place, fire season and level restrictions for logging. And so, and we do put uh, our north part of our district in fire season in a different order than we put the south part of our district from Port Orford South. So I do have the ability to put, take fire season off up north because tr traditionally we'll get more rain up there and it's a different fuel type, right? And then we can leave this zone into fire season. So we do do that. Okay, yes. All right, thank you. Have anything further? I just have one last thing. Um, I got this from our code enforcement officer, and I'm, I'm really interested in your uh, take on this to see whether this would work. So, the safety of the residents of the visitors of Curry County, as well as the protection of property and the support of quality of life is a primary responsibility of governments. This is especially true with both the various fire districts and the Curry County government. In furtherance of these goals, the following discussion points are offered. Fire departments have an excellent history of providing first responder fire supp suppression services and fire prevention efforts for this county. Curry County Board of Commissioners created a position of code enforcement officer to support the county's efforts in assuring public safety, quality of life, and protection of properties, values, and public resources. Fire prevention slash burn permits issuance, and he came up with a possible way of doing this, and this is really what I want to get your take on. Fire prevention programs have traditionally taken several paths, the control of burning and fire exposures, defining, promoting, and enforce, enforcing defensible space, vegetation control, and working with other agencies to promote fire safety construction through building designs, planning, and building permit process. Code enforcement was created to promote, educate, and enforce public safety statutes and practices. It is a tool used across this county, and it is a program which promotes and assists other agencies such as fire service. Oregon statutes provide local fire chiefs with the authority to regulate open burning through the adoption of regulations, issuance of burn permits, and suspension of open burning, wherein the risk for this activity is too great to the property owner and the community. The burn permit process has been used by many jurisdictions to identify burning sites, control air quality, diminish environmental damage, and to respond to safety concerns resulting from local fire loading, weather, humidity, winds, and resource availability concerns. While Coos For Forest Protection Association has taken the lead in regulating regulating use of burn closures, additional input from local districts responding to their community's specific needs and conditions would enhance the fire pre prevention efforts. Therefore, the following is recommended. Fire districts within Curry County each adopt an outdoor burning policy. Each district begin the issuance of fire burn permits within their jurisdiction. Such permits would help to identify smoke and fire sources and allow the local district to restrict burning as per the needs of their district, i.e. weather, fuel load, etc. 
The authority for the issu issuance and enforcement of burn permits is granted to the chief of each fire district by Oregon statute. The, fi uh, the chief may then delegate or authorize a designee to manage or enforce the burn permit program. ORS 153.005 and 153.145 and other applicable statutes and Curry or County Ordinance 10.01.050 he did some research, I see. Grants the authority to counties to adopt and enforce co a comprehensive plan, zoning ordinances, solid waste management program to enforce Oregon Environmental Quality Commission regulations, exercise jurisdiction over county and local access roads to enforce billing codes and other provisions of law. County uh, Curry County Statute 10.01.160 allows for enforcement of ac ap applicable county and state statutes by designated code enforcement officers. This empowering authority also allows the Board of Commissioners to enter into intergovernmental agreements with any city or cities in Curry County and with any administrative agencies such as fire districts to provide assistance and support to their regulations and programs with their consent. I know this is long, but bear with me. It is recognized that the cost of such a program involving both time and cost in issuing permits and to subsequently enforce the terms of these permits could be costly and impractical. Therefore, the following is a suggestion for exploration, and this is where you need to listen. Curry County, in conjunction with all fire districts, would create a berm permit website. This site would allow users to apply for and receive a burn permit via the internet at no cost. Each permit would contain burning restrictions and other information related to the district for which the permit it was issued. A notification of the permit and transmission of the permit information would be emailed to the fire district or could be broadcasted to all fire districts as per the direction of the fire districts. Additional information would be included with the permits as per the needs of specific districts. Permits would be issued on an annual basis. The development of the website would be in conjunction with input from all participants, that's county, uh, fire districts and Curry uh, County Code Enforcement. Fire, fire prevention burn permit enforcement. Enforcement of burn permits would be accomplished either through the efforts of each district or by the Curry Code Enforcement Unit at the direction of each fire district. Enforcement efforts would involve education, voluntary abatement by property owner, issuance of written warnings or issuance of citations for violations. The enforcement practices would be developed in conjunction with input from the fire districts or both the fire districts and code enforcement unit. Records of permit and any enforcement actions would be maintained by the Curry Code Enforcement with copies provided to the local fire district. Enforcement by the Code Enforcement Unit would lessen potential negative in interactions between district residents and their fire district staff. Maintenance of fire suppression efforts. And I don't know whether I want to read the rest of this, but what do you think about a countywide issuance of possible permits? Would that be? Okay. I just want to get input. We always have many boxes. Okay, that's fine. Many boxes. Well, well uh, I, he did his research on that, but personally, with us, when we used to do just blanket fire permits, I still have people pulling permits out from 2000 and let's say 2000. My, I, I, I've got my permit and, and I'm busting them, burning in the city. Um, so that, that's part of our problem. And then, as we said before, um, maintaining that with staff. Um, right now, we only have one code enforcement officer. Mm -hmm. Part time. Part County. Part time. It'd be a burden. Yeah. So you're still going to have the fire districts having to go out and take care of the permits, maybe that they didn't issue. Um, mm -hmm. uh, you know, I'm fortunate enough in the city of Brookings where I have permits that I have, I have paid staff myself and one other person there seven days a week um, that we go out and inspect every burn mm -hmm. permit because um, we talked about the, the issue of liability, but we go out there, we make sure they have a hose, they have a means to put it out. We go over the rules and regulations at the bottom of the permit. Um, it, it outlines what's, what they can't burn. It outlines when they can burn, because 
in the city we try to have them just only burning from sunrise till 4 p.m and then put it out because if we ha happen to get a nice day in brookings and people want to go out on their deck it's not really fair that in the in the evening if it is a nice evening because we don't get very many of those because the fog usually blows in i know people in cold beach don't get the fog as often as we do but um don't you forget that either. i know that <laughs> <laughs> but but we got to deal with the wind that's <laughs> that's why we get the fog but um that way you don't have your neighbors having a burn a burn pile going all all night long while, while next door they're trying and, and and we are we're we're a lot more densely populated in the city so that makes sense but um i just don't see how the little fire districts um that are having problems with volunteers right now i can i can think of uh say in up in the windchuck um having to run run around and uh, you know doing the fire permit so i don't think the idea while a good plan i don't know if it would work in our in so our, are you trying to say it's a bureaucratic yeah, nightmare i wouldn't i'd never say bureaucratic but i just well i i paperwork sorry yeah yeah <laughs> but um sorry yeah i think there. that uh you know if if everybody can get on the internet you're going to get a flood of people wanting permits and then we're going to get um in the districts it's because like i said i have two two fire districts that i that i also um work with that i'm going to get these over the internet and not being sure where they're at um haven't been out and haven't had a look at them and what they're what they're doing um you know because in the spring and the fall we could have high grass with somebody burning that didn't take the time to dig a you know that's burning a 10 yard a 10 yard pile um that didn't take the time to dig around uh, and clear adequately um and then you've got it going right in the middle of a, a subdivision um in the county so i just i don't know how that would be workable well well okay. the research was good i don't i don't see with with our dynamics of the fire service in this county that that it's a, a viable option with only a, a part-time half-time um, code enforcement officer and you guys wouldn't all, all want to contribute to uh perhaps making him a full-time guy would you i know districts that uh are totally self-sufficient by just their pancake feeds so <coughs> commissioner boyce thank you mr chair i don't th i think it's safe to say that nobody in the planet could appreciate you guys more than what we've all been through the last two years each and every one of you and you look at and uh the forest service not represented here that's not by choice i'm sure but russell Whitstad uh has tremendous background um so we'll give him a bad time for either we didn't notify him or we'll get him here next time uh in 2017 uh i called a meeting and you guys all all of you were there except for jeff and i think we forgot him but that was about five or six days before the checo bar fire was discovered and um we had in, we had very good representation, and we only had a couple rural fire departments, maybe four of the 15 we have in this county that were able to get here or get to that meeting. Um, but it reminded me afterwards that the volunteer spirit that they have, the work that they put out, uh, and I sent a letter. Uh, I think about a week later, which coincidentally is about the time the Checo Bar fire was discovered. If you know volunteers, people that can help, uh, and and uh, support, contribute, encourage them. Um, and I know you all do. I know that you are sensitive to the how thin that they're spread, Chief Aaron uh, and, and, and all the others. Um, I think it goes without saying, but I think it needs, we need to be reminded in that. You just mentioned Upper, upper uh, Winchuck or Chetco, Winchuck. all the above. Um, but of course, I have a lot of confidence of the five of you here, plus Aaron, plus Wittstad, uh, the combined experience you have uh, we're just really fortunate to have you all here and and you've come twice in down from coos bay and uh, jeff the, you know the time i i saw your activity and, and contribution you know during the klondike especially um mike you were talking about retiring that's going to be a tough tough thing for our little county here and so i'm going to push you to delay that although you're going to leave with you're going to leave with derwin sir certainly in good hands <laughs> so just i want to emphasize the combined experience uh, and uh, i'll 
Uh, I'll state the obvious. I know, again, that you've spent a lot of time with the small rural departments and keep doing that. And if the county can take a role, I think, Mr. Chair, it's, it's just to get back to that public notification. I got a little plan going, I'll run by everybody. And, and uh, as we get ready for a very mild 2019 fire season, right? <laughs> Thanks, Thanks, Chief. Guys. Thank Appreciate you. it. Thank you so much for coming, and it was very informative. Appreciate it. And we, we, we're here to support, and, and we need to work better at what we do and outreach to our public health service. We absolutely need to. Uh, so, you know, I would, just, I would just close by saying that, you know, if there's, if Jeff Henderson's right on, if, he, if there's districts that want to try to do burn permit programs, we're, we're, we support that 100%. We know the workload that goes into doing it. We don't do it during fire season anymore. We used to, and uh, but but that's that's plenty doable if there's departments that want to try to control that and manage it. Uh, uh, the web-based program uh, is interesting, and it, and it it's going on around us. The web-based programs are for permits. I have a permit. I live in. I have a piece of property in Roseburg, through a Douglas County Fire District Number Two. I got the permit in 2011. I'm supposed to renew it every year, and I still got the one from 2011. So I know how this works if, you, if you're not in close contact with your public. And, and, and it's a commitment of effort, uh, of, of a passion, that, uh, something that you have to succeed at. And if, if you just go halfway with it, you'll cause more harm than, than going all in and making it really work. And it's really hard to make it work the way it should. So that would be my cautionary note. Thank you, sir. Step up to the mic, please. Go ahead, Chief. Uh, the, day, the day this was in question, this wasn't a, a private property owner. This was a commercial burn. Uh, I guess maybe I worded it wrong. Maybe we need to find a way to tighten the restrictions on the commercial companies as opposed to so much the public. Because I don't have so much of a big problem with the public in my district really burning that much. There's a little people making mistakes. But the, the concern I have is regulating the entities that have no regulations. And if they do have regulations, they aren't strongly watched over. The day this went off, three days prior, uh, multiple news agencies told our area to be ready for a Chetco effect. So the effort to put that fire out could have been mitigated sooner, three days prior to this getting away. I, I think that's what I'm trying to get at, is it's not so much the public that I'm concerned about creating large slash piles and not maintaining them. It's the large entities and the logging companies that are building these piles, lighting them and saying they're burnt enough, we can leave. They don't have to check the weather. They don't have to look to see what happens the next day. They can continue to get their job done and move to the next pile. I think that's where the problem lied with this incident individually was the wind was projected three days prior. So we knew the Chetco effect was coming, and nobody said anything to anyone about the fires that are still burning that could have been mitigated. Okay. So, and that was, that's what I'm trying to point out, is we have no control over the entities that do the large piles. Those are the biggest threats. Not so much the, the drunkard in the backyard burning grass. Understood. I'm worried about the large piles. All right. So, yes, sir. right along the same lines as Chief Johnson. And I'm worried about areas that are outside of the rural fire protection districts. And that's enforcement. Like he said, there was the winds were forecast three days ahead of time, and yet there was nobody at that site that night. And luckily, the winds died Saturday morning. If they had not died Saturday morning, this could have been a lot more of a threat than it is than it became. And I think that when you issue, and uh, that's, I guess, would come back to you guys, a permit to bear a burn. It has to, there, somebody has to be there 24 hours a day until the fire's out, period. Thank you. Thank you, sir. 
Well, I will leave that, I guess, to the forces that be, and that's, uh, that's their job to do. Um, anything we can do to help, let us know. Yes, sir. Mr. Boggs? The loggers that are, are that have the permits are required to be there a certain amount of time during the day. It's on their permit. We don't just they don't just walk in the office and issue a permit to these guys. I mean, they, it's a long process to get a permit. We go out and inspect the site. We look at the tonnage that's there. We go through smoke management. So a lot of that stuff is done way before they're allowed to burn. It's not they don't walk in. We give them a permit. Say hey, see you later. Do whatever you want to. So it's a little bit more regulated than that. On that note, um, I was going to bring the example with Harbor District. You know, they, they decide to write their own burn permits, and we do no enforcement in their in their district. Even during fire season, when they have violations in there, we don't enforce the law there. We're not allowed to, under their decision to do that. We can't enforce 477 when 476 is in place. So if you decide to go into your own burn permit program year-round, we can't enforce the law in the summertime either. We don't have the authority to. So that's something to consider. That's something that's got to be year-round. Yeah. Yeah. All right, thank you. All right. Thanks, guys. Thank Appreciate you. it. We're going to move on now to 4B. Um, Chair, yes. um, I do see that the DA's office is here if we want to take their report. No, that's okay. You want to give us your report? Come on. I'm Stacy DeLong, I'm the office manager for the district attorney's office. Everett, I'm here for Everett Dial. He is dealing with a family emergency. So I have just written a quick report. Would you like me to read that? Sure. Is that okay? Yeah. Okay. Um, the DA office is extremely busy on a day-to-day -day basis with absolutely zero downtime. Organization, timeliness, and adaptability are key in keeping the office efficient. It is common for DA offices of our size to have three or four office staff. Currently, we have an intern through the month of June. She has been a great help um, and assistance to me. Um, and with that intern leaving for college, we are advertising for an office assistant to help on a part-time basis. We hope this position will work into full-time once additional DDA positions are filled. Um, I did ask Josh to give us a synopsis uh, from a prosecutor's point of view as well. Um, our deputy district attorney position is funded 100% by federal domestic violence grant. Josh handles all the domestic violence cases that come in on top of his other caseload. Domestic violence is a problem in Curry County as it is across the country. The federal government finances grants for rural prosecution of domestic violence crimes because they realize that DA's offices like ours do not have the resources to dedicate to domestic violence crimes that other offices in urban areas do. The grant we receive is managed by Leah CV of Oasis and it provides funding for one full-time prosecutor and one part-time domestic violence investigator. The prosecutor investigator work together to prioritize domestic violence cases and respond quickly to gather evidence and make contact with victims. The grant has been in place since late 2017 and, and has been very helpful to our office. Uh, in December, the DA's office was able to resolve three high profile cases State versus DeYoung and State versus Stanley were two cases where the defendants were charged with attempted aggravated murder, along with numerous other lesser charges. This was a murder for plot hire, I'm sorry, a murder for hire plot wherein Lucas DeYoung hired his brother-in-law, Robert Stanley, to murder a man over a long-standing grudge. Stanley went to a storage unit in Harbor where the victim spends the majority of his time and shot him three times at point blank range. Miraculously, the victim was able to get in his truck and drive away while calling the police. He received numerous injuries, but none that were life-threatening. After a long, drawn-out process with both DeYoung and Stanley, they pled guilty to attempted murder and received 90-month prison sentences in December. Um, State versus Qualley was a case of rape in the first degree, along with other lesser charges. The defendant in this case was accused of raping his biological daughter when she was 12 years old. At the time of trial, she was 15. The defendant was found guilty by a jury, sorry, the defendant was found guilty by a jury of rape in the first degree and sentenced to the mandatory minimum of 100 months to, 100 months in prison. He will also have to register as a sex offender for life. The adjudication of all three of these cases was the culmination of a lot of hard work by everyone in the district attorney's office. The DA's office is challenged in hiring and recruiting attorneys to work in Curry County. Our office has been short one attorney for over a year. 
it is very difficult for us to keep up with our caseload when there are only two attorneys in the office. Most of the applicants that we have are recent law school graduates who do not yet have the required certifications to become licensed attorneys in the state of Oregon. After interviewing qualified candidates, we have made job offers only to be turned down because the applicant has already accepted another job or they just weren't that serious about coming to Curry County in the first place. As you can imagine, this is very frustrating. Currently, we are working with the University of Oregon Law School to begin a summer intern program where students going into their final year in law school can come to Curry County over the summer and get valuable courtroom experience. This would be approximately a 10 week internship. The hope is that we get talented young prospective er attorneys to come work with us and once they get to Curry County, they enjoy the area so much they want to start their careers here and once they graduate, once they graduate and pass the bar. Um, next was our victim advocate program update. The victim advocate program is fully grant funded we currently have four grants that support our office. These grants are set to expire on September 30th, 2019. We will be requesting to renew some of them and we'll be applying for new grants as well in the upcoming months. We have, full -time, we have a full-time victim advocate director, Gwen Nielsen, who is responsible for quarterly grant reports and submitting them to the state for review. She also oversees our part-time victim advocate and juvenile advocates day-to-day -day work and reports all victim data to Everett and Josh as needed for upcoming cases. We were recently approved by the grant administrator to have the juvenile advocate become full-time until the end of the grant cycle, which is, just, which is September 30th, 2019. Our goal is to keep her on as full-time with one of the new grants that we will apply, we'll be applying for and hoping to receive. Our victim advocates are in court for the 9 a.m. criminal docket every day. This helps them know the cases that they are working on and gives them one-on-one -on -one contact with the victims. The victims attend court on occasion and the advocates are in contact with them after each court appearance to keep them updated. They also help answer any questions that the victims may have or refer them to other outreach programs such as OASIS or DHS, etc. The advocates also attend Wally's house interviews as requested. Those are our forensic interviews. Our juvenile advocate attends all juvenile court sessions that have victims of crime. She calls or meets with the victims to keep them updated and refers them to other programs as needed. The advocates meet and or talk to 20 plus victims per, per week and that number is increasing. The advocates uh, attend court hearings and trials with the victims and their families. They help walk them through the process and support them during an emotional and difficult time in their lives. And finally, we have the update for Wally's house. Um, their challenge at this time is raising public awareness of child abuse and the role that Wally's house plays in intervention. They continue to work to increase funding through grants and events in an effort to ensure services remain at their current level. Uh, they want to expand their funds to the level of centers around the state and the country. Um, in 2018, they provided services to 47 children. They performed 41 for forensic interview interviews, three Carly's Law exams, and three SANE exams were performed. Uh, 2019 to date, uh, they provided services to 11 children. There were nine forensic interviews performed and one Carly's Law exam performed. Thank you. Sorry, it just sounds so robotic. I just have <laughs> one, one question. Would it be helpful to maybe have some apprenticeship uh, kids come in, maybe high school kids, yes. to do maybe clerical work, that type of thing? Yes, we are exploring that option as well. Okay. Yes, it would okay. help. Yeah, we are going to, in conjunction, Ms. Gold's going to look uh, in conjunction with some other departments to do that. So okay. we'd like to add you to that list and, and get with the, with our schools here in the county to, to look toward doing some more of that. That would be phenomenal. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. All right. Thank you, Stacey. Commissioner Boyce. Have you had a chance to look up to tour Wally's house yet? I have not. It's uh, Thank thanks, you. guys. Thanks again, guys. Be safe. Did you leave your card? Yeah. Appreciate it. Okay. Thank you very much. All right. Next on the agenda, presentation of our budget discussion. Ms. Colstrom, you have the floor.
uh, Louise Kallstrom, County Accountant. And um, this discussion is uh, kind of um, looking at the handout that I gave you last week. Um, the one that has the two from contributions. And <clears throat> so this is uh, where I am on the budget right now. Um, as we discussed last week, it's a static budget. It's One second, please. We've got a, we have an issue. Are we having an issue? I think Commissioner Gold is I was trying to get no. out of this. By the way, have we uh, introduced ourselves to our budget committee members here? Mr. Elkhorn is there. I don't know if you know them, uh, Louise. Um, I have met Richard. Richard. Hi, Brett. <clears throat> that was her fault, not mine. <laughs> it's, yeah, it's my fault. I'll take it. First to admit it. It's nice that you guys work together. <laughs> okay. Share the blame. Well, if I'm wrong, I'm wrong. I knew Louise was going to want this, so I was trying to help out. All right, there you go. Can you make that any bigger? <laughs> uh, well, if I made it bigger, I w you wouldn't. That's okay. It's kind of, it's kind of just a, uh, a talking point, really, um, to show you where we are. Um, this is what we saw last week, correct? Yes, this is what I handed out last week, and, and I went through and explained, um, like, all the notes on the bottom right. um, and the format of this spreadsheet. Um, <clears throat> the bottom line is, I don't, I have this, but I don't have a, uh, the arrow thing, but um, the mouse. Is that the mouse over there? You can use the arrow down is what you can use. But do you want this? I just wanted to use the mouse. Okay. So this number, I love this mouse, right here, is um, as I go through and, and put in proposed budgets and everything, this is a number that I watch because this one has to be zero by the end of our um, proposed budget. It's, uh, um, but a uh, balanced budget, um, that the proposed budget has to be balanced. I can't present you with a, a proposed budget that's so not balanced. So <clears throat> somehow I have to get that $256,566 as it sits today. That's not the final number. Um, but that, I have to get that to zero. Right. Um, <clears throat> so what I'm trying to... Uh, um, get from you today is on these notes down at the bottom I have done some um, uh, some things to the static budget number one I did remove the pilot program and we discussed last week that if we do put the pilot program back it will be over in the grant funds it won't be in the general fund like it was before um, I do know that um, the <clears throat> uh, juvenile office wants to add a part-time community service supervisor position, and that's not added to this static budget yet. Um, it does include um, the road fund transfer for the four deputies, but we also discussed moving that to a restricted um, grant or local fund. Uh, rather than having those that special funding be in the general fund um, there is included in this a, uh, an extra um, FTE that's called the records management 0.7525 FTE is in the sheriff's civil criminal P patrol office and the other 0.25 is in their 911 dispatch Okay. And um, 
Then I also moved the code enforcement officer to have its own department rather than bury, being buried in non-departmental. And we did make that full-time, which in the general fund went from 0.25 to 0.75. Okay. <clears throat> it also does not include yet the um, admin costs um, impact from any increases in admin costs, which we do know that there are some increases in the commissioner's office. And uh, some of the direction I wanted to get on that one is the travel budget that you want in place. Do you want $30,000 there or do you want um, what kind of uh, travel budget you want in place there? And um, we do have some <coughs> information that we need from um, our IT provider in order to figure out if we're going to have increased costs in our IT department. So that's where I'm sitting now. Um, the direction I'm looking for is, first of all, is this one okay, <laughs> where we are right now? <clears throat> to balance the budget, um, what I am going to be recommending is uh, basically using um, some of our carryover balance in a conservative way. Um, and I would say no more than increasing our carryover balance more than 500,000. We're at 256 plus that 75 plus <clears throat> the question mark IT. Right. Plus I'm not sure what else you want to do for staffing if you're gonna think of more assessor's office um, people or not, I've heard that that might be coming for this budget. Um, so the direction I want to know is, <clears throat> besides this 256, uh, is is the $500,000 where you want to go? And if it is, is there anything else that you want to see in this budget um, besides what I have up here on the screen? So that was your discussion for today. I would, I would say probably we're going to be in line with the 500,000. Uh, I, I can't imagine being, being much over that. Um, but we do have, you know, we are looking for hopefully during the budget season to do some consolidation as well. So we, we may be able to, to loosen that number some. Um, so I'm not sure what consolidations, are you gonna give me direction on that for the actual proposed budget, or are you going to do that during the uh, budget committee for the approved budget? I think it'll probably end up during the budget committee for the approved budget. Okay. I think the $500,000 minimum carryover is really important because we always end up having, I call it my crap happens fund at home, but it happens. Yeah, so the, the carryover you know, we, we do um, have some one-time money that's influencing that carryover. To use 500000 of it to balance this budget is conservative. But if you, and, and it's kind of looking to the future too, because this board has been very active about funding, um, alternative funding for the county. And if we can keep things going for a year or two, um, this way then um, and get that funding in then we'll be okay but if we don't get that funding in sooner or later we're gonna have to cut this budget by five hundred thousand dollars so I, I'm just cautioning about how you if you start increasing your carryover fund balance revenues sooner or later you're gonna come to end of that if you don't get additional funding in I understand Commissioner Boyce, do you have any? Well, 500,000 is less than a million, which is what my concern was, or more. So I'm not saying that's good news, but it's better, maybe. It is better. Yeah, thank you. Actually, I think we can come in under that. I actually think once we get into the budget, <clears throat> we've got some, some fresh faces on this, and we've got some very active uh, things going on right now. I'm hopeful we can actually break in under this. Um, and then hopefully by next year we will have a strategic plan in place before, well before budget season uh, to give us clear direction on where you need to go and where this county needs to go. 
Okay. Um, so I, I have a couple of other things. Um, as, <coughs> as we are um, setting this budget and keeping under at or under as far as we can that 500,000, um, I will be working with um, any budgeting questions with um, Director of Operation um, Smelzer. And I did not know whether or not um, I would also be working with liaison, finance liaison, um, Commissioner Pash. If I do that, that would be um, Commissioner Pash and Julie and I finalizing the proposed budget. Right. If that is the consensus of the board to do that that way. I believe that is. Uh, I don't know if you have. Group. No, that's fine. Could be happier. Good. I have one question on here. I'm just sitting here looking at this on number three. Uh, the three hundred thousand dollar road fund that was for the four deputies. That did not include their cars, if I'm reading that yeah, correctly. Yeah. So the original uh, this year's budget was for four hundred and eighty, right. and so I'm taking that from four hundred and eighty down to the three to cover the um, four deputies although I think three is a little low for four deputies um, but well, we always have openings full, full pack, yeah. <laughs> so what basically what I'm going to do is uh, in in the restricted fund um, I call it a restricted fund restricted revenue fund which is um, fund 251 which is state and other local grants or other restricted funds like that donations or any kind of uh, monies that are totally restricted for what they're being spent on. If I uh, put a budget for road deputies over there, I will budget enough road funds to cover those four and only take the amount to cover the ones that are hired and working that year. Okay. All right. It might be more than the 300, but this budget did, in this static budget did include a revenue of 300,000. <clears throat> Ms. Kerr. Yes. She wasn't looking for, you weren't looking for uh, specifics from us today, right? Well, um, it's specifics. Probably the sooner the better. <laughs> well, specifics on budget direction. Um, we can't discuss um, outside of the budget committee before the proposed budget, actual budgeting. So I'm looking from for the board for uh, direction on where we're going to go, like uh, setting the carryover balance or something like that, but or to um, budget for specific like ad positions or something like that that I will tell department heads when I hand out their worksheets. So I'm not exactly sure what your question is. At the beginning, I thought you said you might want specifics from us today on. Well, I'd like you to discuss, but I can't we cannot discuss the proposal of the budget today it cannot the first time that we can discuss that is the first day of budget committee no you you clarified well thank you thank you okay okay so i have um, another handout for you all these numbers. <clears throat> so I'm going to read, um, this is from our auditors. It is a best practice comment from them doesn't actually go to our audit but they do um, do some best practice comments sometimes and this one says <clears throat> we noted that the county has more than the legally required number of funds according to um, NCGA statement 1 paragraph 4 governmental units should establish and maintain those funds required by law 
and sound financial administration. Only the minimum number of funds consistent with legal and operating requirements should be established. However, <clears throat> since unnecessary funds result in inflexibility, undue complexity, and inefficient financial administration, we recommend the county consider closing funds that are not required to be in a separate fund. Both the GFOA, Government Finance Officers Association, and GASB, <coughs> Governmental Accounting Standards Board, encourage governments to use the minimum number of funds. So this handout is, if you look at <laughs> the, um, the first column there, I have numbered the number of funds that we have. We have 39 funds. Um, and so um, onto the, uh, I have moved some of those funds to be combined with other funds. And the, um, the little chart on the, on the right there is the proposed number of funds, which I went from um, 39 funds to 25. So that is combining into the road department all the road department funds that they are responsible for. That doesn't mean that all of these funds will be intermingled. It means they will all be under the same fund number. And the number, <coughs> um, the number like four, <coughs> 431 defines just the road department, 431.10 is the roadside improvement. The 41960 is general services. So even though they all have the same fund number of 115, those uh, department, as you would say, numbers um, would, when you print out the financials, they will still have their own page for that money. Um, but they will be combined under all 115 for the auditors. Okay. Um, I see what you're saying. <coughs> So um, I did move, uh, well, actually have 24 because in there is the airport, which is actually um, no longer ours. So, yeah. so we'll have 24 funds. Um, um, so the, the sheriff's um, department, which is you know, listed as number nine fund on the proposed, they've already done that. All of their funds that are over there in restricted funds are all under one number, and um, that number is 128. So they have under 128, they have all of their <coughs> separate parole and probation, um, reserve, marine, forest, inmate, um, SAR. They're all separate, but they're all in the same fund. Um, I propose um, taking the commissioner's office, which is in a fund by itself, 111, and moving in to the rest of the administrative costs um, funds, um, along with every, all the other administrative costs. I don't know why that one was set up as a separate fund in the first place. It should have actually been set up within the 220s when it was established. Um, a couple of them have already been closed to the general fund county lands and cable TV franchise are already closed and they're closed to the general fund. So um, as we do the proposed budget, I'm proposing to make these changes in the proposed budget. It doesn't really change anybody's budget. It just changed the reporting of those monies. Sure clarifies and makes things a little more streamlined. I think it does. It's going to be a little bit of work. And the first couple of years, when you look at the budget document, it might be a little confusing because there'll be a little note on it saying, move to this other place. Um, but I think that after um, two years, I think it will be, you know, after three years, it basically drops out of the budget document and it will only see, be seen where it is current, you know, in current place. I think having the chart number, the 212, the 135, you know, on it as well helps clarify and draws you to where it needs to be. So yeah. I think that's very helpful. 
So do you think this is going to be a good thing to have as we go through the budget process? Because we're yes, going to have to be I, I would be back and probably forth. this would probably a document as where I moved the, where they were before and where I moved them. Right, yes. right. Because I know you compare <coughs> things year to year. Yes. And are we going to have to be flipping pages to do that comparison? Or? Um, I have to present the budget document the way it. I mean, so the budget document has the two years of actual. Those will have to stay where they actually were. Mm -hmm. I don't migrate those. So the detail, the past detail will be on one page and the current budget might be on another, yes. Okay, so we'll just have to deal with it. Yeah. We can handle it. We might have to deal with that a little bit. Um, there's a couple in there already that are like that. I mean, the, all the sheriff's ones that were in the general fund, if you look at the budget document, it has the history there and then it has a little note in the current um, part that says, you know, you have to go to fund 128 because that's where it was moved to. Okay. Well, I guess as long as the notes are there, it'll be easy to... Yeah. What do you guys think? <clears throat> I have a lot of questions and I have some comments and I'll talk about that. Okay. The same way as me, I'm just interested in learning the process because we're going to have more workshops to get started. And I realized I'm just Okay. Um, the, is it on? Oh, they need oh, to speak. Yeah. Sorry. Um, the question was uh, more workshops. Actually, uh, we will have a um, the first day on May sixth. I believe it's May sixth. Um, on May sixth, we will hand out the budget. Read the budget message. Um, it is a uh, take public comments. And at that time, I will be going over um, the budget document, answering any questions about the budget message, which basically t explains what you did in this budget, um, and uh, doing any training on um, budget committee and their roles as, um, as a budget committee member. So that's the kind of training that we will do. We'll go over and make sure that they can look at and, um, and read the budget document. And then once, um, <clears throat> once those are handed out on May 6th, uh, then we will come back on May 14th to start the budget deliberations. So we really won't be discussing the proposed budget or deliberating on it on May 6th. We will only be presenting it and doing some training. I'm not sure what other training you might uh, want to require, but I'm, I'm not sure when I would be able to do any other training than that because I have a, a budget to be published by <laughs> May 5th, and that's going to be a difficult task. You guys both have the, the budget calendar and everything? Okay. Maybe before you leave, you can get that from Ms. Colstrom to make sure. Um, I know it's on do, the website do as well. You, do, does every, all the budget committee members have emails? So if we can make sure that Ms. Colstrom so, has your email and contact information, I know it's on their, yeah. on their resumes, but uh, that way they, you could just include them. So, yeah, so what I'll be sending them is a budget calendar and um, a pamphlet from um, Department of Revenue on, uh, uh, it's a, called a budget committee handbook. Okay. So Good. I'll send those out ahead of time, and then we will go over those on the first meeting of May. Great. You can't, you have to be able to yeah, talk. Yeah, you have to, everything has to be recorded, sorry. Sorry. <laughs> yeah, because the first thing I saw on the internet was April 29th, and I haven't checked since then, so right. apparently that's... Here's the budget uh, committee calendar yeah, right here. You can take that. Right okay. And then give Ms. Colstrom your information, and then we'll, uh, she'll include you on everything. Yeah, I don't know where I got that. I think back in January I got that. Is this available on our website? I thought I saw it on the website, something about April 29th. I may have seen it when they were asking for volunteers, but I, I believe, might be wrong. I believe that the uh, budget um, calendar is on the website. It should be already. There it is there. I might have missed it. Okay. Yeah, just go ahead and get Ms. Colstrom your private and personal information, and she can... Okay, uh, she I see can, what I did. She'll include you on all the... On the uh, emails and everything sir thank you thank you sir uh, now the the budget calendar does come 
contain a couple of dates that are not um, pertaining to anybody but really me. I mean, I have to do, per I have to publish notices of these meetings and that's on the calendar. That doesn't mean anybody else has to do anything. That means I do, so. I understand. <laughs> All right. So the main date next coming up for budget committee is May 6th and then the week of May 14th. Um, another thing that uh, a combination of, of funds is um, I have talked to um, uh, county clerk. She has two departments within the general fund. One is elections and one is recording. Everything that they do from their paying their staff to putting in a claim for office supplies, everything has to be split 50-50 between those two. So every time she puts in a claim, she has to calculate and put in two account numbers to split that claim 50-50. So she, uh, the only reason that they would have separate uh, departments for recording and elections is elections, they have to track the expenditures to um, bill special districts for their um, part of uh, cost of elections. However, she does that on the side anyway. So she doesn't think that would be a problem because she already tracks that separately. And um, so she's still not sure whether she wants to put the proposed budget as one department or in, during the budget committee combine them. I'd rather do it in the proposed budget. It's a lot easier to, as I go from proposed to um, <clears throat> approved to adoption to have it already there. Um, but, you know, I'll, I'll talk to um, county clerk again to make sure, but that might be something that will appear also in this proposed budget is combining those two departments into one. Okay. So is there anything that you guys were thinking that you might want in the budget or take out of the budget or anything else that you have comments on that you might want to Discuss. Well, I know you earlier asked about the travel budget, and I think we set the travel budget for twenty thousand a year, if I recall. Was was I was it? thinking fifteen, maybe. I'm well, it was fifteen for the rest of the year. Ah, it was fifteen okay. from. That's why five, I've got yeah. the number thirty up there, is because you set the travel budget at fifteen from January till June. Right, and it was already. And five. it was already at five. So, so that's what I thought we were going to leave it at, because historically, I think we we read that it had been at twenty thousand per year, so. Anyway, on a, on a number for that, I think that's kind of where we were with okay. 20000 So, all right. I just wanted to clarify that one because that one was a little confusing about where you really wanted to be on that one. Commissioner Boyce? I think 10 or 12 is going to be where we'll probably end up. In fact, that might even be a little high. I mean, I don't, I'm not sure what yours will be, but uh, mine's running about 300 a month. Uh -huh. so I'm just, let's, well, if we don't use it, we don't use it. That's great. Okay. Then we got a surplus the next year. No. Is that how it works? No. <laughs> it don't happen. I could be wrong on that. <laughs> okay. That's all I had. Does anybody else have anything? Okay. So um, what I'm going to do right now, are, are you going to give me direction on adding any staff like assessor's office or? Well, what I'd like to do, if you don't mind, is I'd like to sit with Julie um, and her and I then uh, have a couple of conversations in the next week. And then, uh, and then come back to you, because uh, I'd like to talk to Jim in his office. I know he had mentioned uh, Mr. Colon about having some staff addition in there. Um, but uh, as the liaison with you and then having Ms. Schmelzer, as we just agreed to, I think it'd be a good thing that her and I sit and talk about some things. If the board would like us to bring them back in front of them with you, um, we can do that or just bring them to you and then we can address them in the, uh, in the well, May 6th meeting. In, on the um, April um, 5th, I am handing out budget workshops, and at that time I usually have uh, given direction to anybody that has any staff changes, and um, also, uh, so Julie um, Swift has updated their payroll, and before I hand them out on the 5th. So if we're going to do any staff changes, 
either additions or subtractions i would like to know so that we when we hand out these uh proposed budgets they're already there waiting for their the only one that i can think of is is jim cole and the assessor saying that he may ask for a couple of part-time not full-time i believe there were two part-time um and i can get with him tomorrow or the next day on that and we can julie and i can confer and we'll let you know by the end of the week okay um all right, other than that, um, we'll, we'll work together to balance the budget. And um, I, I don't think that we'll have any other uh, board presentations between now and um, May uh, Six. 6th. That just means that between now and then to balance this budget, it will be you and me and Julie. Okay. okay. Commissioner Boyce, did you have something else? Yeah, just the uh, on a contractual basis, legitimate, you know, we might have two or three positions that would be very beneficial there when we're trying to find resources uh, the strategic plan we've talked about yeah so well, the strategic plan we're going to try and do in a, through the grant process um, and I, okay. I think we're pretty confident we can get that um, Commissioner but, Boyce was just speaking about the uh, the possibility of having some professional services um, that we might want to have some sort of a you know I don't know set up something for that so in the general fund there's non-departmental and that's one of the expenditure ones that I will be working um, closely with um, Director of Operations to set the budget for that. I will also be working with her to set the budget for the commissioners in the BOC office. Perfect. All right. That's all I have. Back to the strategic plan real quick. Yes, sir. If we wait for grants, I'm just, you know, as I mentioned in the earlier meeting today, I'm concerned about just any delays. Um, I, yeah, I think it could take a year, but I'm concerned we don't have that long. So, um, anyway, we might want to budget for that. Did we already identify a grant for it? No, when we originally talked about it, we said we would try and pursue as many grants as possible, but we may end up paying about $50,000. Okay. That's what we had originally discussed, but hopefully we can get that down as low as possible. It just went out today um, for the RFP process. Okay. So I guess I'm guessing you'll get that there. help. Um, yeah, th I mean that that would be um, uh, Julie. Uh, when we discuss non-departmental, that's probably one of the line items that okay. she'll be um, discussing about what we have in that fund. All right, because I thought we had said we identified a grant, but all right, that's fine. That's all I have. Anyone else? Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Nothing else? I am oh, we ready. Are, see, yes. I'm ready, willing, and able to present county council. You had the DA. Yes. And you've got uh, county council. I are see we ready that for that? Here now, yes. Okay. Johnny Two Shoes, you're up. <laughs> yes. I am wearing two different shoes today. Uh, <laughs> Jeez, poor guy. Just one of those days. <laughs> it was rainy and dark this morning. Blame it on uh, the weather. Since we have new commissioners, uh, I see a new presentation that I presented. This is an old budget presentation from a couple of years ago, uh, but essentially it just starts with um, who is the county council, and county council is 2.0 FTEs essentially. It's myself and Brenda Starbird. It uh, gives you a little bit about who I am, admitted to practice to the courts. I've been chair of certain statewide organizations and uh, have a couple more years experience under my belt um, on that. Uh, we have a contract, uh, Carrollton Law Firm, Frederick Carrollton and Shayla McKenzie Kudlak, and they've got uh, over 40 years combined experience. And then Brenda Starbird's been with the county for 15 years and county council for a great portion of that talking about what county council does we provide legal counsel to the board of commission county officers departments various boards and commissions we attend public meetings and work sessions and we advise on legal rights and responsibilities and other legal issues uh, we advise and provide training to county departments and staff on appropriate actions on a variety of legal problems and issues involving risk management we interpret federal state and local legislation statutes rules etc we research and prepare ordinances, resolution, contracts, agreements. 
leases, deeds, and other legal documents. We investigate and analyze legal issues. We research, study, interpret application of laws, court decisions, and other authorities and precedents, and we prepare opinions and memorandum and briefs. Uh, we review all claims against the county, take appropriate action, including coordination with the county's insurance company and defense attorneys. And uh, we prosecute and defend and appeal legal action suits and other proceedings on behalf of the county. We prepare and present cases at trials and hearings, and we investigate facts, interview and uh, depose witnesses, and we prepare case reports and summary, serve as a risk manager. And um, at that time, we were facilitating county um, meetings. We're not doing that so much anymore. Sources of the revenue for the county council are general fund, internal service allocations, and then franchise, solid waste, and cable television. After I got here, I questioned why county council was paid out of ca cable television. And since that time, they've moved cable television into general fund. Um, your options for county council, there's mm, more or less three options. One, you can contract outside legal counsel. Uh, a survey of the recent area, well, really just Gold Beach. Maybe I didn't get in touch, I didn't get any response from Brookings, but Gold Beach pays their contract outside counsel um, 190 to $200 an hour. And last year, their last complete budget year, they paid $40,000 for outside legal counsel. Um, that's for a population of about 2,200 people. So we're 22,000. If you multiplied that by 10, you'd pay 400,000 for your legal costs. So are you asking for a raise? Nope, I'm just trying to give some perspective. Um, I did check with another county, Hood River County. They contracted outside legal counsel at $71,640 per year, but uh, they did not, that outside counsel did not do litigation or code enforcement, and that outside counsel would charge $150 per hour to do any litigation or code enforcement. And then that county also used a separate counsel for land use, bonding, and labor. And uh, currently you're using me for land use and labor, and we haven't done a bond in this county for a long time, but I would recommend using outside bond counsel. Uh, Crook County, they have two full-time lawyers and one paralegal. They have a population of 20,690. They're, they use internal. And then Baker County, their county council duties are performed by their district attorney. Uh, that is part-time and it did not include $35,000 for a labor lawyer, but they have uh, two deputy DAs plus a staff. So they have a total of seven, full-time employees and when you compare to us at that time our DA staff had 3.74 and County Council had 2.0 so we we're at 5.74 versus 7.1 when they did the DA doing their County Council um, and really those are your options on for County Council just give you an idea of some of the things we've accomplished um, in the time since I've been here, I've been trying to help the Board of Commissioners with its work as well as serving the citizens of the county. Um, in the, I've been here roughly three years and in that time I've helped um, the board obtain favorable resolution for our citizens. Uh, one of the early actions I was involved in was Flores Lake. Our citizens were complaining that a state agency was causing a problem for them and I went to bat for the county with that state agency and we were able to get a favorable resolution where we were able to uh, basically preserve the status quo for our citizens up there. Um, also uh, obtained a favorable result for uh, our citizens down in the South County where there was a nuisance property. I was the first county council in as many years as anyone can count who actually took a property owner, a vacant property owner to court over the burned out nuisance condition of their property. It had been such a long time that the court didn't even know what the process was like. So I had to educate the court and go through some steps. And since that time, that's allowed the successful uh, movement of our code enforcement. Uh, First County Council, been a long time to even sell a piece of county property. Before Julie Schmelzer left, she assembled a list of X number of hundred of county properties. Why did we have X number of hundred of county properties? Because we never sold one in a long time. So uh, she 
got the board to say, hey, start selling these things. And I said, well, I want to do one first. <laughs> After we sold the first one, uh, we received the money and then the treasurer didn't know how to distribute it. There were just a lot of questions. So no one had seen one of these things in a long time. We, we sold two of them and that whole <coughs> property sales took a different direction because I think the prior board assigned it to the economic <laughs> development director after a time and then it just kind of went in a different place and so I, I think we're going to get back active on that um, we assumed tax foreclosure duties from the district attorney by statute either the county council or the district attorney can do tax foreclosure cases those are really a civil matter and they were kind of a just a strange item for the DA to handle. So we just took them back and they're really a civil matter. So we've been doing those for the assessor. Um, since I've been here, I've prevailed on behalf of the county at the employment department when a terminated employee tried to claim uh, unemployment benefits and we defended that and justified our termination of that employee. Um, that was a lady named Terry Perez. Uh, I prevailed at the tax court on behalf of the assessor against the city of Brookings challenge of an, they claimed an exemption on a piece of property and we, we did not agree to that. I prevailed on behalf of the county at the Land Use Board of Appeals on the golf course appeal. And I prevailed at the circuit court on behalf of the, of the county to help our citizens on the Dement Ranch uh, Warehouser case where we got the circuit court opinion to say that uh, our decision was wrong. And so um, a lot of uh, things, just in the month of January, there was a report, um, oh boy, there's just so much um, that we worked on, uh, but we're also doing grant administration for the Brookings Head Start, trying to help provide uh, early education for um, kids. Um, that's a Board of Commissioners direction. Just again, trying to hit some of the highlights. I did help arrange, there was some recent training on management and harassment with CIS. That's one of the risk management jobs. Uh, I work on the safety committee. We review all of the loss reports and recommend uh, improvements to be made. Uh, Brenda and I administer the Port Orford Landfill Trust. Basically, the county owned the landfill. It was declared some kind of a, I don't want to call it a super fun site, but it had problems and so we had to cap it and stick in monitoring wells and we have a fund that allows us to uh, do monitoring and abatement of that and we're responsible for that and that's partly why our salaries are paid out of out of the um, solid waste disposal <coughs> fees um, what else I'm working with the district attorney you heard a little presentation about Wally's house today and Wally's house is for uh, children victims and uh, they are trying to go private and so I'm working with the district attorney's office and making an agreement where we'll transition that into a private um, entity. Um, I've helped assist on leases for buildings, the fair, human resources in multiple personnel matters. Um, worked with the juvenile department on getting an intergovernmental agreement with the Brookings uh, School District for a resource officer. Talked about no camping signs. Um, just many, many things. Uh, Again, lots of contracts. Um, you all have seen my work on a daily basis and um, just a lot, a lot of work gets done out of our office. We're involved in, in, I think, almost everything you guys see. And if you think you're busy, then we're right there with you. So really, that's all I've got. It's been a pleasure over the last few years to serve the county and, um, you know, be here ready, willing and able to serve you guys uh, to your uh, choice uh, in the future. So that's all I had unless there's any questions. Well, I have no, I'd like to say thank you to you also for, for helping me to kind of get my feet under me the first couple of months. And, thank you. Uh, thank you. Your legal advice and counsel to me has been uh, very good. I do have one question on here, the presentation. Um, the outside contract is 2000 a month for roughly 18 hours. Do we use all those 18 hours? Or is that just an estimate to reduce the number? It, it, it's an estimate, and I, I tell you what, I've, I've talked to outside counsel about that, and we're getting value out of that, but if, if it were 18 hours, 2,000, it works out to like 25 bucks an hour. Seven an hour. Yeah. Thank you. And I, 
what they do is they send us a bill, and, and essentially this is a continuation of an existing practice. Uh, and I, I haven't really tried to change a whole bunch of things since I got here other than trying to, you know, say why are we paid out of the, you know, franchise fee and that kind of thing. But, um, and also just try to do some things that hadn't been done before where citizens needed, you know, some help. But at the same time, um, I've talked to outside counsel and they basically said if you <clears throat> are going to ask us for a hourly report, then we would then want to go to one of these classic outside counsel, $190 an hour contract. So it's a little bit of a compromise. Um, I'll be honest with you, it, again, I, it's one of my, well, that's, I guess that's a idiosyncrasy. I always say I'll be honest with you and I, I I always, I don't think I trust people who say that, but what I, what I will, what I will say. I'm almost say, what, especially when you're hearing that from what, an attorney. I know. Well, when can you tell when a lawyer is, is yeah, lying? Never mind. No, no, we don't need to go. I know. Thanks everybody. But you've been a great audience. But, uh, but what I will say is that, um, if, you know, if, if belt tightening was needed, um, we, you know, that would be one of the first, uh, things I'd recommend we examine if we can, you know, what would it, how much would we use that outside counsel uh, for whatever dollar uh, rate we could, we could bargain, um, you know, and would it, would it equal 24,000 a year? I, I really don't know. I really don't know. Uh, if you want, I can try to study it, but I, I think if I ask for an hourly by hourly billing, I won't get it. So it'll be hard to, hard to make that study. I understand. I wish your voice was ahead of you. But, oh, just uh, maybe you can't comment. Was it the warehouse or grazing uh, issue? Is it ongoing? And, thank you. But, it is. But you had, it some, is ongoing. You had a tremendous it's success there. Thank you. And uh, again, uh, at I, that was the board's uh, direction, and so I tried to carry it out, and we got a favorable result. They have filed their brief. Warehouser has filed their brief at the Court of Appeals, so that's at the Court of Appeals, and our brief is due this coming Monday, and my intent is to ask for a first uh, motion for extension of time. They call it a moet, uh, not like the champagne, but um, first extension of time. And they ask for, it's very common, Warehouser asks for an extension of time on their first brief. So we'll, we'll do that and give ourselves a little more time. But essentially, uh, the same arguments are being made at the Court of Appeals as were made at the uh, circuit court and I liked our chances at the circuit court and I like our chances at the Court of Appeals and I've done dozens of appeals and uh, had five or six cases at the Oregon Supreme Court so I'm you know that's my read we have a very good chance of a good outcome at the Court of Appeals on the on that case so Commissioner Gold I just have one last comment um, several years ago when I first came on I was like oh we what are we doing this extra counsel for? Mm -hmm. And when I saw that it was $27 an hour, I backed way off because I know that a lot of times when you're on vacation or can't be here and with the number of meetings we've been having, um, I think that's invaluable. So e Even if it's not $27 an hour, I'm, I'm certain that it's far below the 190 yeah. and $200 an hour. Exactly. And uh, the resource that Shayla provides being available on the spot her institutional knowledge of the county. She also is a government lawyer for several of the other local jurisdictions. Um, she's just quite valuable. So I, I think, again, even if it's not penciling out exactly at that dollars and hours, for two grand a month to have a, an attorney on retainer just to handle any overflow, it's hard to put a price tag on that that would be any any less. But again, that's that would be a board decision and, and that kind of thing. I just have one last question about the same issue. Do you use her other than just having her sit in our meeting? Oh, yes. Okay. Yes. Um, so here's one of the ways I try to use her is I try to give her as much of the fair uh, work as possible. Uh, I also give her some roads work. And by the way, I gave her all of the wolf work. Um, you know, that was a North County issue. Yes. She's a North cool. County uh, kid um, that's that's the other part that she knows involved. a lot of the people who could yeah. be affected so another part about uh, having Shayla uh, on our side she's she grew up around here and she's she's part of the of the community and uh, 
she's she really knows what's going on. But anyway, so I thought that was such a, a unique issue and such a something that would be so close to her, you know, wheelhouse that uh, I put her in charge of that. And I try to give her as much fair work as possible so that I can do that. Um, and then she does some road stuff. So, but she does pretty much everything I ask. Uh, she's doing one of our other code enforcement cases. She's doing a real sticky one where she's got a fight with a lender and there's, she's fighting some national financial lending institution here in circuit court uh, to get the Benham Lane property uh, cleaned up. And again, couldn't be done without a lawyer on that one. Dave, Dave is doing great, just doing great. But um, some of the stickier cases, you're gonna have to pay for a lawyer on that stuff. And as you saw, even the other counties who have the outside council contracts, that one council said, if we have to go to court, we're gonna charge, for lack of a better word, real real world dollars on that. So, mm -hmm. uh, by the way, also, uh, and I know I'm apparently, my, my pay stub from last year said 80,000 or something like that, but I know, because I'm trying to do my taxes, but I know, uh, Commissioner Boyce, you've been putting me up there at 90, and I think it is that now since you guys gave everybody a raise, and I haven't really asked for, you know, I wasn't one of those people who came from some other high-paying jurisdiction and said, well, I'm only going to work here if you pay me, you know, what I'm used to making over there. I just kind of took what the going rate was. It's been in place here for a long time. Um, not looking for anything special, and I understand the difficulties the county's in. Um, so... Anyway, like I said, that's really all I got. And uh, I think with this new composition of the board, the kind of stuff you guys are doing, um, keeping legal counsel very busy. So, um, and I, I enjoy being busy and I enjoy variety. So I'm enjoying it. So thank you. Thank you, sir. All right. Anything further? This meeting is adjourned. Well, should we start a uh, coupon for your shoes? Precisely. <laughs> I think so.